we have attendees. Now we have Fire Chief John Alston is here in the waiting room. And Jonathan Garrett, that is the um, consultant or vendor for the car autonomous bus program. And Doug is not here yet. Doug's not here yet. If we could get one more alder, you'd ready to call the order, although you could start now if you wish. We'll give him, we'll give him a few more minutes. We have somebody yeah. who also logged in by phone, 507-8232. And here's Honda Smith. I'm bringing her into the room now. Okay. We now have a quorum. So, Alder Decola, will you join us for the sake of a quorum? I'm in. All right, then we will get started and hopefully Doug gets here before we adjourn. I'm bringing Brian Wingate in now. Okay, good. All right, I'll start. I'll start reading the notice. Call the meeting to order at 6.03. And I'll read the notice. It's the Board of Alders notice in New Haven. Public Safety Committee of New Haven Board of Alders will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, October 20th at 6 p.m. to hear and act on the following legislative item via video conference at https colon double back double slash bit dot ly slash three four six b q u c for the required password contact public testimony at newhavenct.gov or by phone dial 646-558-8656 and enter webinar ID 995-9538-9784 and phone or voice only passcode 482-744-5050. The item is LM2019-0711. It's an order of the Board of Alders authorizing the mayor to apply to be part of the state of Connecticut's fully autonomous vehicle testing pilot program. This item is on file and available for public inspection in the office of the city clerk, 200 Orange Street, room 202, New Haven. For order, Honorable Gerald M. Antunes, chair, attest Honorable Michael Smart, City Clerk. For accessibility-related requests, please contact 203-946-7833 for voice or 203-946-8582 TTY prior to the meeting. Public comment and testimony may also be submitted via email to public testimony at newhavenct.gov before 2 p.m on the day of the meeting. If you wish to present testimony at the meeting, you must register in advance at https colon double slash bit dot ly slash 346 bquuc or by calling 203-946-7934 before 2 p.m. on the day of the meeting. I'm Gerald Antunes. I'm the chair of the committee from Ward 12, and I'll ask my colleagues to introduce themselves, starting with my vice chair, Alder Wingate. Vice chair, Brian Wingate, Ward 29, Beaver Hills. Okay, uh, Alder Roth. Abby Roth, Ward 7. Alder Smith. And sitting with us, Alder DeCola. Alder Sal DeCola, Ward 18. 
Thank you. Uh, this item has been heard before, but there were some questions left up in the air that we needed to get answered. It's taken us this long to get the answers, and uh, hopefully uh, they're all here. I see uh, we've been joined by Alder Haywood, Ward 11. Uh, Mickey, has Doug arrived yet? Uh, you're still muted. There he is. Okay. Um, Director of Traffic and Parking. Uh, first, I want to start off with the question then for you, uh, Mr. House Layden. Is the, and this is I think this is the most important question we should start off the meeting with. Are the funds still available and is this program still viable? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Doug House Layden, uh, Traffic and Parking Director, 115 South Water Street. I uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to have this uh, item brought before you again. Um, the what's being requested is adoption and approval to begin to be um, to join in the state of Connecticut's autonomous vehicle pilot program. They've authorized up to four municipalities for the right to have autonomous vehicles uh, ride on their streets. And what this uh, order before you would give us the power to apply to be one of those four cities uh, with me. To, and, and so there is no funding yet defined for anybody who would want to take a pilot uh, yet. However, um, uh, only four municipalities in the state of Connecticut would be possibly authorized uh, to, to join in the pilot. Um, and I can invite Jonathan Garrett from, uh, one of, from Stantec, our consultant team, to answer a few more questions with you, with us today, if that's okay, Alder, uh, Alder Antunes, Mr. Chair. Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Alders, and uh, thank you. Um, you can address for the record, sir. Uh, this is Jonathan Garrett with Stantec Consulting. Address? Uh, address as 165 West Portland Street, Unit 423B, Phoenix, Arizona, 85003. Thank you. Proceed, please. Uh, I believe one of the outstanding questions was regarding the indemnity clause in the requirements agreement. Uh, so after speaking with our lawyers at Stantec, uh, we were able to establish that this is a question of risk mitigation and liability. And it, the agreement language we recommend be clarified with city and state uh, attorneys. Um, just, uh, I think the point is that the, the consulting needs to be done with counsel around risk management and liability. And uh, if Stantec were to be are required to be in on these um, conversations. It's something that we could do, but in our current position, that's our lawyer's recommendation. Gotcha. So, and there were some other uh, pen pending questions as well, Mr. Chair. Would you like us to present our presentation or would you like to go through the questions? Which would you prefer? Well, let's, I think we should resolve that first one. We'll, someone hold harmless the city of New Haven in this whole project, because that's what's going to be important to us. We certainly don't want any litigation against the city, and I believe our assistant corporation counsel, Mr. Cassini, is, is on the line as well, might be able to comment on that. Sure. Um, Name so and address, it's please. It's Kevin Cassini. I live at 43 Chestnut Street in Mr. Square. Thank you. Um, so a hold harmless agreement, I don't know if it would come from Stantec, which is the consultant, or if there's another company that would enter into um, the pilot program. So until we see all the places, it would be tough to know who exactly would do it. But it's important to remember that even a hold harmless agreement won't keep the city from getting sued if the plaintiff wants to sue the city. All it would do would be help us navigate that litigation. There's really nothing that we can do to help avoid litigation. If somebody wants to name it in a suit, then they're going to do that. The idea is to have the paperwork done ahead of time so that if it should happen, we don't suffer the liability, but it doesn't, we won't still have to shuffle the paperwork. 
I think we can stand shuffling paperwork as long as it doesn't have a dollar sign next to it. Um, so uh, that may entail um, having us named in a um, insurance policy. Possibly is that a we, better, is that a better? Yeah, there's way? a number of ways that we can. Well, we could be named as a dish insured in an insurance policy. Yeah. Sure, um, we could include an indemnity or a hold harmless clause with a company that chose to come into the city, take advantage of the program. Uh, there's nothing that um, precludes us from belt and suspenders approach, which would be both. Um, but right now we don't know who that partner would be. And so it's tough to come up with what the answer would be to the hypothetical until we actually put the, the players together. Okay. All right, thank you. I just wanna also recognize all the Crespo has joined us, a member of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Doug, you want to continue then? Thank you. That would be great. And I think last time we were unable to present our uh, presentation. I wonder if we could go through it at a quick pace. I know we've provided it to the committee before electronically, um, but I wonder if Jonathan would be given powers to share his screen and we could roll through his presentation pretty quickly. Uh, the one that we, I think we read it out loud last time, which is only only partially helpful, I would think. Well, uh, let me look first. Uh, Alda Wingate, did you have a question regarding it? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I did. I, I, I hate to go backwards, but I have to go backwards to go forward sometimes. So I, in the, you asked the question in reference to like, do we have the money to move forward with this project? And I could have sworn I heard that it has to be selected from one of the cities to even do this pilot program. Mm -hmm. So it's not even like that New Haven is on, you know, like it has to be selected out of four cities. It, it could be Hartford, it could be, it could be New Haven, it could be Bridgeport, it could be to do this pilot program. Am I right? That's a that's a great point, Alder Wingate. And um, so, and I think this will be answered by Jonathan's presentation, but let me answer it directly first as he pulls it up. Um, the the uh, the idea, what's before you is to, to give the city of New Haven the ability to become one of four cities authorized with which to have autonomous vehicles tested in their cities. The state of Connecticut would only would only grant four municipalities the ability to do so, uh, and our application process is to become one of those four cities. Um, once we become one of the four cities, we would then try and find partners to launch a pilot that would be interested in launching a pilot program with us uh, in the city of New Haven, who would then be we would assume responsible for uh, all of the all of the funding for the project. The other way funding could become available would be through grants from the federal government or the state governments. What is not before you is a request for funding for the for the um, from the city or from the board of alders, and I think that is covered in the fiscal impact note. That um, uh, and that's why it would be zero. But it's also understandable that um, then what is before us is really just the permission to become one of the four cities in the state. And the reason we're doing that is a number of reasons. I think. Uh, first and foremost, one of our biggest concerns in the department is how the future of these vehicles will be impacting our, our populations and our communities. Uh, our community in New Haven is 20, well, the last time I checked in with Michelle Dupre, um, the, the disabled population is roughly 24% in New Haven. We have over 12,000 customers of the Greater New Haven Transit District, the paratransit service in New Haven, in Greater New Haven. Um, not all of the 12,000 are from New Haven proper. Um, I also think that, so So for, for one, we have to be at the table in order to know what's best and, and to make sure that the voices like Michelle Dupre from our Office of Disability Services is well represented and well heard, make sure our Disability Commission is well represented, well heard. The, uh, you know, the other reasons we're, we're, we're doing it is, is really about, um, you know, this is the first time in, in a long time and since my six and a half years on the job where uh, Yale, Yale New Haven Health and the public have come together um, and talked transit. And so 
you know, Yale and Yale New Haven Health provide their own shuttles. Um, what's right. exciting about this is a partnership out of the, the Air Rights Garage uh, brings all three people, all three partners, the city, Yale and Yale New Haven Health to the, to the table. And CT Transit is excited to, to be there as well to figure out uh, what, you know, what benefits we could, we could learn from a small pilot such as this. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you so much, thank you so much. No um, and I had to turn on my light, so I had to, I had to switch seats for a second. And then this is for the, our uh, council. So from my understanding, he's saying that basically we still could be sued, right? If we have this pilot, we still could be sued. Only thing they would do is help process the paperwork of the complaint. Well, no. That's uh, not what I, mean, I meant when I said, when yeah, I said but, Yeah, talk to me, explain when that. When I said paperwork, what I meant was this, the stuff that ends up on my desk. That's right. When we get sued, th there's really no way we can contract ourselves out of being sued. Okay. We've spoken a lot of, in this meeting and other committees and subcommittees about governmental immunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are some ways that the state disallows people to sue the municipalities. Mm -hmm. This won't be one of them. Um, so we're going to prevent people from suing us. If they want to, can. The only thing we can do is insulate ourselves from the liability. Okay. Yeah. So like, no, I, we can't stop ourselves from being a named defendant. They're not right. going to help with the paperwork. It's just that if somebody should lose, then whoever we get to agree to indemnify us or hold us harmless mm -hmm. would end up the ones to have to pay. Okay. Right. But it won't give me work off of my desk or Doug. It's not that that's your turn, but right. um, so there still be some type of time cost associated with it if it should result in a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, no, no way for us to set it from the get go that we can just um, mm -hmm. shield ourselves entirely from that. No, no, I get that. I, I, I respect that. I just, I, and I clearly understand. I just wanted to, I got a feedback. So I just wanted to, be very very clear right because i don't know if everyone got that right so i just want to make things very very clear about what we are stepping into if we step into it thank you yeah we don't have a proposed agreement or anything like that right now um we haven't identified a partner with which we're negotiating terms or anything like that um we're still at the very onset of all of this but if it's important to the city that there be included a hold harmless agreement or an indemnification clause, um, as there was um, with other programs that the city rolled out throughout the summer, spring in response to the health emergency, then you know we can certainly include that in our discussions. I'm not suggesting that it won't happen. I just want to make sure that everybody understands if we can get it put in place, what it's capable of doing for us and what it will shield us from. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'm all set. Okay, Doug, you can continue then. If, if, Mr. Chair, I had a few follow-ups to the Vice Chair's questions, which were very helpful. If I can, um, they are on the same topic, if it makes sense to go now or if I should wait. Um, let's, let's, let's jot them down and wait so that we can get through at least uh, what they're trying to tell us about the project. Sure, thank you. Hey, Jonathan, you want to head to um, first slide real fast and take us through it? Yep, sure. And the goal being, um, yeah, I think you, the goal being, yeah, let's get to questions very quickly is our goal. Yeah, uh, well, we've gone over a lot of this. We'll work through it. We kind of know this just explains how transportation is changing. We've highlighted a few topics here, but I want to kind of get to the point of why we're doing this. So there is definitely a parking tie-in, which is how the Air Rights Garage and other garages are associated with the program to understand the impact uh, on supply and demand as it relates to automated vehicles. Um, and this really uh, is so we can understand how specifically shared automated vehicles kind of impact the environment, the built environment in the community. Uh, so we've primarily been evaluating this vehicle platform, um, a self-driving shuttle, as it's commonly referred to as, 
Uh, it's kind of like a bus without the driver, although onboard operators are required uh, per the state of Connecticut and would be involved in any uh, deployment carrying uh, passengers. Uh, or a streetcar without the cost. It's a lot more flexible and affordable to implement in terms of infrastructure. Um, one of the early requests was to kind of get a little video of one of these things moving. This was one that I just had on hand from a demonstration. Um, I'll just play it. They're relatively slow moving vehicles between 12 and 15 miles per hour. Uh, they can operate in mixed traffic, but a lot of the deployment environments kind of have been these um, kind of cordoned off guideways in, there, in certain cases, but with the proper lane striping and signage and potentially connected vehicle uh, technology, they could operate in normal traffic. Um, here are a few specifications of the vehicle. So we've mentioned their low speed. Uh, this is a top speed of 20 miles per hour a capacity of eight to 16 people uh, with wheelchair accessibility that reduces the total capacity a bit, uh, but there, but most of the vehicle platforms and especially the ones we're considering do have a wheelchair ramp and tie downs or securements on board uh, that the operator would be able to assist uh, in case there is need. Um, you can kind of just compare the dimensions and the capacities. And here's an example of a few of the leading manufacturers that are out there today and all of these manufacturers have deployments in the US currently. Um, so this reviews the indemnity question. Um, I think we've kind of gone over this and we can definitely address it after I get through these a little bit further. Uh, this lays out some of the requirements per the state of Connecticut. Um, so the Office of Policy and Management encourages uh, and allows for the testing of AVs on public roadways. But like Doug said, they're limiting it to approval in four cities to begin with. Um, a resolution at the municipal level is required. There's no monetary award or state funding tied to this approval. And it doesn't mean that you're obligated to actually implement a deployment. Uh, written vehicle vendor agreement must be signed by the municipality's chief elected official uh, before said vehicle operates on public roadways. And so uh, the vehicle vendor agreement must meet all of the minimum required frameworks, uh, which we will look at on the next slide here. This is an overview uh, summary of them. So the vendor must sign an indemnity agreement. Um, this is them taking responsibility beyond the liability insurance that they're required to carry. Uh, the specified pilot beginning and end dates must be just that specified um, and approved by the state and their consortium. So the DMV, the state DOT, um, the Office of Policy and Management. Uh, things that need to be documented prior to a deployment, uh, a lot of these would be provided by a chosen vendor, which would be the next step if this were to move forward. Um, the, the experience would be defined, meaning kind of the concept of operations and how that specific vendor would work within the geography. Um, how it interacts with the public, um, the safety mechanisms, the infrastructure requirements. Uh, this would relate to the required safety assessment. So hazard assessment and risk mitigation, outlining physical and digital infrastructure that may be required to mitigate any risk. Uh, a summary of the training provided to any operators. If the vendor is not the operator, but it, the vendor also could be the operator. So this is a uh, training for maintenance and operations employees, but as well as emergency management services. Uh, proof of insurance, of course. Uh, then some specifics about the vehicle, the vehicle identification, registration, and proof of inspection. So uh, conducted by the DMV. Um, the driving plan with the goals. So listing out the KPIs, the key performance indicators specific to uh, the vehicle and the service that we've outlined. Uh, operator information so contact information as well as um, kind of a, a resume of, uh, of capabilities and roles and responsibilities uh, and then the public outreach campaign which would include um, various forms of promotion uh, to the public and then this 
the general awareness that goes along with having an AV operate within the community. Um, another requirement, the operator must always be on board. Whoops. Um, and no operations allowed on limited access highways. And then there are reporting requirements, which are specified in the framework agreement, but can also be augmented um, once a chosen vendor uh, is under agreement. So I think some of these latter slides we've actually kind of gone over. Um, the plan is to apply for the state of Connecticut OPM approval to deploy up to two fully automated shuttles in downtown New Haven, operating between the two Yale New Haven hospital campuses. Um, right now, the concept would be to serve hospital employees and family members of patients weekdays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, with probably some downtime for charging in between. Um, John, the goal, these, oh, would, go ahead. these would be publicly available shuttles to anyone and cost zero right right yeah this is the, yeah this is not a this is not a uh, a paid service it uh, funding would need to allow for um no fair yeah, for, for no yeah. fair collection yeah and exactly for from the public to jump on yeah thank you keep going so uh just outlining a few of the goals that we've kind of addressed already but to compare to the current transportation system uh, the position is a forward thinking and tech advanced deployment and serve a real world transportation need. So this circulator first last mile service um, as something that currently exists in a manually operated form. And so this would uh, allow the stakeholders to collect information and understand how AVs could be implemented in a similar fashion, serving the two points of interest, the hospitals and surrounding parking infrastructure. Um, and we've gone over kind of the list of partners. As of now, tech providers have not been specifically chosen, although through an RFI process, three respondents provided their information. Um, that was Easy Mile, uh, first group, I believe. I don't have the other one in front of me right now. I believe it was Perone Robotics. Um, This was a little bit about how we evaluated the site and the technology. So these were the considerations, of course, the destinations in question, community priorities, the various user groups and demographics, uh, the service quality. So getting at the frequency, the headways, uh, things like that, the, the physical alignments. Um, there was a thorough site investigation that would be followed up on in a safety assessment phase after a vendor was chosen. Um, understanding the various roadway characteristics, the access and conflict points, uh, those all relate to the safety assessment and uh, the technology limitations. So the, the uh, actual design capabilities of the chosen vendor. Um, then there are some storage and maintenance considerations. So we've identified a possible garage along how they might be able to store and allow for um, daily and light maintenance. Um, we've outlined possible infrastructure modifications uh, depending on the alignments chosen, modal competitors, so understanding how this vehicle um, negotiates the roadway with privately owned vehicles, uh, transit, and any micro mobility, and then the various land use impacts, so understanding the long term effects on parking. Um, and other modes of transportation. And uh, from there, um, I wanted everyone to kind of understand the types of technology and what goes into creating uh, uh, the safety fusion system of a vehicle. So a lot of times the overlapping sensors are referred to as sensor fusion uh, design. And so this diagram shows how uh, the overlapping and redundancy um, work to ensure uh, no objects are missed in the environment and the vehicle reacts to them um, in a redundant manner. So the first um, mitigation effort is to only allow low speed operation. So that's less than 25 miles per hour at a top speed, but operating speeds likely between 12 and 15. Uh, the vehicles have a 360 degree sensor suite um, 
made up of radar, LIDAR, optical cameras, and ultrasonic sensors. And I can explain a little bit more in detail if anyone has questions later about the purpose of each of those. Uh, the braking mechanisms, there are between two and four redundant braking mechanisms per vehicle, depending on the vendor's design. Uh, and this includes if the motor to were, fit, were to fail, a mechanical brake would engage, um, allowing for an emergency stop. Uh, there's also an emergency stop inside the vehicle that the operator will have access to. Uh, there is two-way telecommunications to the remote supervisor. Um, there's, of course, the onboard operator. Um, so there are two humans in the loop, so to speak, uh, a remote supervisor and the onboard operator that are monitoring activities at all times. There's the possibility of V2X connectivity which stands for vehicle to everything. This is radio communication that allows vehicles to speak to infrastructure and other vehicles. Uh, trained emergency management personnel. So required for implementation is the training of emergency management staff, police, fire, um, paramedics. And that program would be um, introduced from the chosen vendor. And the cybersecurity and privacy policies are per a vendor agreement. So uh, a lot of times vendors already have their cybersecurity um, platform in place. And it would basically some, be something that is negotiated and agreed to when the vendor is chosen. I wanted to talk a little bit about operational safety as well. So that was the vehicle side. Those are items on board but some of the operational safety insurances include uh, third-party safety verification from uh, some tech partners such as A-Verified. They conduct operational safety audits. They ensure ops safety compliance, meaning uh, if a vendor says what they're going to do doesn't happen, you're aware of it. This is all quantified in a risk assessment and delivered in a report. Um, they also identify the performance of the automated vehicle. Um, there are a couple of other systems. Icarus is a process compliance and verification platform that takes uh, best practices from the aviation industry where they uh, timestamp all procedures. So safety checklists, pre-launch operations, uh, maintenance procedures are all documented in a standard digital format. They can be shared with the city and the state on a near real-time basis. Um, and so you can see what processes were completed prior to launch. You can uh, have a, a host of checklists on board at all times if there's any emergency situation that needs to be handled. Um, so digital compliance verification there. Uh, and then the, the last company, DRISC, does AV testing, training, and validation on a library of edge cases. So this is important. This is this is an optional, optional but very important part of the safety assessment phase where uh, this partner helps understand all of the various risks associated with a deployment environment. Um, they bring in their library of edge cases, meaning um, rare events that are very unlikely to occur but could occur, and they're able to identify those, quantify it, and then train the automated vehicle system to deal with them without ever having to actually encounter them in real life. So it's a preparedness measure. Um, we had a bit in here about jobs because there's usually questions around how this does affect the job market. So I have a few sources here. This can eventually, I mean, this, could, this is a much larger conversation than we probably have time for today. But uh, if there are concerns about this, it's definitely worthwhile taking some time to review. I've just made a few notes here that in the short term, considering five to 10 years, AV operations will require a similar number of employees to traditional modes. Um, onboard operators will likely be around for a while, especially for public and shared transit. Operations and maintenance workers will definitely still be required and remote supervisors will still be required. Um, AVs should be positioned as supporting but not replacing existing modes. This vehicle class in particular, the shared automated vehicle, is looking to fill mobility gaps and to complement existing transit. 
uh, or lower or lower performing routes. Um, and as it relates to trucking, this is maybe not of concern necessarily, but the trucking industry was short and continues to be short a significant number of drivers. And so we will likely see automation take place first in trucking um, at any large commercialized scale. <clears throat> um, also related to the job outlook, just a little bit more about the economics of it. Uh, 15 and a half million US driving related jobs in 2015. AV jobs uh, increased 27% year over year in January of 2018. So definitely on the rise. Um, I don't know if this is, this might not be exactly on topic right now. So I think I'll skip past this and get to some of the pilot information, but I can come back to this if it's of interest. Yep, I think noting it and moving through the slide deck a little faster would be helpful. Yep. That'd okay. Uh, these are all of the preferred routes overlapping. The reason there are several uh, is because we can have a preferred alternative that is um, that is the kind of the core, what it would be operated daily. But the Connecticut DOT requests diversionary routes in case of an emergency or a roadblock. They want to have routes that can be uh, the vehicle can be diverted to. So we'll go through each one. Uh, we kind of went over. I described them last time, but this is the route that currently exists. So we're replicating that. Uh, this route is a potential diversionary route. It operates along MLK Junior Boulevard, which we've noted it can be higher speeds, even though posted speed is at about 25 in at least one location that we found. Um, uh, a third alternative route, which takes uh, a slightly lower speed, less congested route through a neighborhood. Um, and then the final preferred alternative, which uh, it operates on the least congested routes, does have a few crosswalk conflict points throughout this neighborhood, but doesn't need to interact with these higher speed frontage roads. Here's the breakdown of some of the specifications. So you've got length, average speed, various headways, um, some of the characteristics. So viable storage location within 650 feet of the route, yes. And then we've tallied the number of traffic signals, stop signs, pedestrian crossings, and required lane changes if the vehicle to operate along that route. A little bit about uh, the identified storage location. So along Howe and Dwight, the garage, um, it does have height clearance. And when we initially uh, looked into it, it did have space to accommodate a 10 by 10 by 18 maintenance bay, which would basically be used for storage, very light maintenance, possibly cleaning and storage uh, or in charging. Uh, we're basically done here. This is a little bit about our process. Uh, we're, we're kind of in this area, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the uh, review area, manufacturer site review or a vehicle manufacturer and import review um, before approvals. Um, yeah, we can get into cost. This is, this is just a status update. So where we're at now, we're doing a part two safety committee review. So I think that was all my slides here, Doug. Yep. Thank you so much. Now, and Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation. We're here to answer any questions. Okay, what, what I'll do as far as questions, I will go around the members of the committee in order. If they have questions, then let me know. I'll start it with our Vice Chair, Alder Wingate. Yeah, I am, um, I wanna, Two minutes. <laughs> two okay. questions. If we can keep it to two questions, we can always go around a second time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, so this is my second one. Um, how much? How much do this vehicle cost? Uh, the vehicles are usually procured by lease at this stage, uh, so the the vendor is very hands on. Um, they assist in, like I said, all of the training and maintenance. 
And so we're seeing contracts between 12,000 and 30,000 per month. That's depending on number of vehicles um, and all of the other services required. So depending so, on the need, they would be able to provide an estimate. So we, we, don't, we don't know how much the vehicle costs. We know a range, but we don't know uh, until we have a definitive concept of operations. Uh, we don't have uh, any quotes for the pilot. But but Doug, what do you do? You have anything to add? Oh, just just reiterating that the since we don't have a vendor on board, we don't yet know the service plan. We don't know how many vehicles will actually be needed. Um, Come on, Doug. Uh, come on, come on, Doug. Come on, Doug. Come on, Doug. Come on, Doug. Talk right. to me, Doug. Let's keep it under control here. I, 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 I mean. So the. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's, really, it's really an important question, right? Because ownership is is is. Is, is a key component. Like, what are, like, I just, I mean, may, may, maybe, maybe there is no answer to that question, right? Like, how much did it cost? Well, so the, the way that these are being paid for in other cities is by leasing. <laughs> and so it's a short term lease. But again, depending on how many you lease and et cetera, it could be anywhere between 10 and $30,000, as Jonathan mentioned. But the, what the city brings to the table is, you know, being one of four local, if we were to prove this, we, and if the, the, you know, we would, and if the mayor would, you know, send, we send this up to the governor's office and we're one of four locations, we get to bring to the table access. Um, you know, we get to bring to the table the expertise of our, uh, of our transportation partners and our transportation department. Um, but we, we don't necessarily need to bring the capital or the monies to run a pilot. Um, and that's why the, that's why, you know, what's before us today is to, um, to, you know, to, to, to allow the mayor to sign documents. Um, if the mayor were, were to want to spend money on it at a future time, that also would come before you as a budgetary matter um, before, the, before the body. And so, you know, the, right, what, what is before us now is to, to, to put us into the, into the one of four, one of the four cities. Thank you. No problem. I, I, I completely understand the question. As, uh, I appreciate the question. All right. So bottom line is during the pilot program, there is no cost for the city of New Haven. Right? That's what you're saying, That's Doug? Correct. That's correct. Now, I, I did hire Stan Tech to help us with the application because it's not a field that we're familiar. Um, but there's not an expectation necessarily of a city contributing funds. You know, the, the idea is, is bringing together partners like the hospital and the university, um, both hire uh, transit operators, Pro Park, and I think First Transit uh, to provide their transit services at those two institutions. Um, perhaps their, their operators would want to partner with us. We know that CT Transit wants to partner with us um, in, in whatever uh, your, your, your committee and your board allows us to apply for. Um, but I, I, I also want to just highlight that, you know, the cost that we are bearing right now is the, the hard to quantify cost of, and the folks that are in the Dwight management team neighborhood know that, you know, have been talking about this, you know, the cost of being a center city that provides 60,000 jobs to the region and the cost of asthma in our neighborhoods. And, you know, one thing about uh, this, this disruptive technology that is coming, um, you know, I, from the department, the department standpoint is that it needs to be a public service, um, and rather than private Teslas running back and forth to say uh, the sh you know somewhere in the shoreline, for instance. But um, you know, the the benefit for being one of the four cities is that you know we we are sought after by private corporations to partner with. Okay. All right, uh, just take a break and uh, welcome Alder Singh, who has joined us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next is Alder Crespo. You have any questions? Two questions. If you have more than two, just hold it to two for now. Appreciate it, Mr. Chair. I certainly don't have any questions this time. 
Thank you. All the roof. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you also for allowing us to have a second round. Um, I guess I did want to follow up first on the, um, just to make sure I understand what the vice chair was, the helpful questions he was asking for about dem indemnification and the hold harmless. In one of the slides, it said that the vendor must sign an indemnity clause. I guess I'm not clear, is that the same as a hold harmless clause? Because my understanding from the conversation before is we hope to have whoever we partner with sign that, but we have no guarantee that they will. They may say they won't. But then when I saw that slide that that was a requirement, I wasn't sure. So if that could be clarified, that would be great. Sure, uh, Alder, I can tell you. Uh, Indemnity and hold harmless are not the same thing, but the end result for your purposes would be the same. Um, we would be shielded from having to pay. Um, hold harmless means that they would step into our shoes when we were named defendant, and indemnity would mean that if we we're found liable, then they would pay. Not exactly the same, but ultimately the financial responsibility would be on whoever signed that agreement with us. Great. No, thank you. That's super helpful. And just to make sure I understood the slide correctly, did that mean that no private vendor could do this unless they agreed to sign that indemnity clause? Jonathan, can you throw that slide back up? I think it was the um, FAVT, sure. you know, the um, the minimum framework. And yeah. so uh, thank you, Alder Roth. The, the answer is that no vendor is allowed to launch a system without the mayor, without a contract with the mayor. And as part of the contract with the mayor, um, the minimum frameworks must be met. So proof of insurance is part of that, uh, is part of that, um, that framework. There you see it. So uh, it was in my presentation, but I wanted to show you where it came from within the framework between a municipality and a tester. This is the document provided by state OPM. So paragraph K here is, I think, what we're referring to. So to Alder Roth, your point, your second point, I think, which was it is a requirement. They're not allowed to operate without doing that first. Great. Th thank you so much for that. And um, then another follow-up also on the other questions my colleagues were asking. Okay. Um, just to make sure I understand um, the issue of payment. And I, I understand that what we're applying for is to be chosen as one of the four um, locations. But if we are chosen as one, I, there, I think part of that is then we'd have to have um, two vehicles driving around as part of that. And that would have to be paid for. And I think what you're saying is, but correct me if I'm wrong, as of now, we, we don't know who would pay for that. Maybe the hospital would, since it seems like it's very much benefiting them. Maybe another, you know, entity would, I guess. So I guess a two part question. One, am I correct that if we get accept as one of the four, there will be a cost because we'll have to actually have the test. And two, I guess my question is, why isn't Yale New Haven Hospital here so are saying they will cover that cost since it really does seem to be benefiting uh, their patients and employees, since that's where the route is going. Sure, I think I can handle, uh, I, I could take the first question definitely, which is um, the short The short version is, and Jonathan mentioned it briefly in his presentation that because of an approval here and being one of the four cities, it doesn't necessarily mean there will be a pilot that gets launched. You know, we still have to find out uh, if people want to do this pilot with us. And one of the, one of the conditions of the pilot is the city, you know, has not approved and, and does not have an appetite to approve funding for a pilot like uh, with all well, this. And that's okay. We, we can go out to the market. We put out bid documents, you know, um, you know, for better, for worse, our bike share system similarly was installed by the private sector um, and is not, it was not paid for by the city. And so that it, there's a lot of interest in wanting to test real life scenarios uh, with respect to um, uh, autonomous vehicle shuttles. And there's also 
other people like other private sector uh, actors that that are interested potentially in funding something like this to get on the ground floor. Um, you know, we do have interest from the shuttle provider for Pro Park, uh, who is always interested in partnering uh, in any way uh, that they can. Um, so I'm not. So we're not yet confident how it will uh, get paid for. We are confident that there is interest, um, and that I think we would like to be one of the four. Irrespective, again, just even if we don't actually have a, a shuttle going around the city in the end, um, we would want to make sure that our voices are at the table and being heard uh, for the uniqueness of our of our New Haven, um, you know, our our town. Wait a minute, Doug. We we got to get on the same page here. A few minutes ago, I asked if during this pilot program would there be any cost to the city, and you said no. Now which way is it going to be? Uh, I do not, I don't, I know is still the answer and, and nothing has been approved, right? The, you don't have a budget item before you to approve anything. It, it's only a giving us the permission to apply. Um, and so the answer is no, there, there's no cost to the city. So does that confuse you all the rough? Yeah, I, I just want to um, just to, so if we, if say, pretend we vote yes tonight and you apply and you get accepted to um, as one, if we get accepted as one of the four cities, then you'd have to come back and say, now we're applying for funds to allow us to actually have one of these shuttles that can work. And if we say we said no, um, cause, and, and maybe there'll be private funding, but say there wasn't, and then the city said, no, do we get kicked out of that group of four? Or are we still allowed to participate in the group of four, even if we don't have the capability to fund, uh, either privately or by the city to fund the, the test? Sure. I think eventually we will be dropped out of the group of four, uh, the four municipalities and Jonathan, you know, correct me if you remember the four better. Um, one was Stamford, Connecticut, um, one was, uh, uh, where is Bradley International Airport? Windsor Locks. One was Windsor Locks. Uh, one was in the, the Yukon campus at Stores, but I think it was actually a neighboring town maybe. But, and then New Haven was, gonna, was slated to be the fourth. The, you know, the way that, yeah. And so then Jonathan, you know, after tonight, do you want to explain the bid process in order to get a contractor and see about funding partners at the table? Yeah. So yeah, like, like Doug explained, this is so you have the option to implement a program if you want to go down that path. Um, so an approval by the state, it would just be a notice from them saying, yes, you guys can go ahead and do it, raise funds, procure, you know, start going down that path. We like your concept of operations well enough to allow for that. Um, and so if there was interest then at the local level here in New Haven, um, then we could start looking for funds from private entities that might want to be involved in the project. Um, we could start going through a procurement process and evaluating technology and coming up with uh, those costs, uh, Alder Wingate, that you were interested in, because that needs to then be approved on a, at a separate phase uh, before we go into any deployment talk. Um, so this, the phase that we're currently in is just to get to to get permission to start for the fundraising and the, uh, the vendor procurement and its cost evaluation. We're kind of at a preliminary step still. <laughs> Thank you for patiently answering uh, the questions. Is that helpful to, to lay out? Thank you, Alder Roth. Alder Haywood, you are next. Any questions? Try and keep it to two questions and we can go around again if you have more. Okay, I was just uh, curious. It sounds like this helps Yale. I mean, is this more applicable to Yale or to the residents of New Haven? As we'll be giving free rides to Yale, if I'm not mistaken, we'll be giving free rides to, to the nurses, the doctors, also some of the patients that go through Yale. That's a great question. I mean, this is this a, a program that will be open to all. Also, one more thing. When you have these operating electrical buses, I know I went somewhere and 
the operator was not allowed to help me. So if someone got on the bus and was disabled or handicapped, would they be allowed to assist the person? That's or would great, there be someone on the bus that could? I'm just. That's a great question, Alder Haywood. And I'll, Jonathan, if I'll take the first one, if you can take the second one. You know, I think what's, uh, the you know, the, the, the big challenge we have is being, you know, a place that provides a lot of jobs that a lot of residents have, uh, but also a lot of the region have, is that a lot of people still drive themselves to work. And so, you know, the, you know, the interests of the department to, you know, really focus on the areas between the two hospital campuses is really one about equity with respect to trying to get as many people to not drive or to reduce the number of car trips on our roadways. And so as, as you mentioned, Dr. Haywood, would it help anybody in, in New Haven? And the answer will be yes, it'll, there'll be a lot of uh, New Haven residents that are able to jump on the line and find it helpful to get closer to downtown perhaps from uh, Gilbert Avenue or um, from uh, Sherman. Um, and the route's designed to try and prevent people from driving from one hospital to the other, which still happens quite a number of times a day. Additionally, uh, it's designed to, to try and mimic an existing shuttle line that has very good passenger count information. And that shuttle line is restricted only to Yale New Haven Health employees. Uh, but the, the idea is to, to make it free, available, and open to the public, and really trying to study an area that has a real need for alternative methods of transportation, rather than simply what's happening is, you know, building parking garages and, and renting parking uh, for all of the employees at the hospital. Jonathan, would you answer the se second question and then we'll check in? Yeah. Uh, so one of your points about an operator being on board, the answer is yes. That is a requirement of the state's agreement and just a, a, a requirement a, and I think a philosophy of how we're kind of um, operating within this realm right now is that yes, for all of our deployments that we're scoping, onboard operators are required um, and they are allowed to, and it's part of their job description to help in cases of accessibility. So all of the vehicle technology that we are evaluating do have wheelchair ramps. Some are deployed automatically, some are deployed manually, but the operator is there to assist with that and the vehicles do have uh, wheelchair tie downs and securement. Um, related to just the, the, the wheelchair infrastructure on the vehicles, the vehicles have um, microphones, speakers, uh, LED screens. So they cater to a range of accessibility needs, not just focusing on wheelchairs, but that is the wheelchair requirement um, is of course there, yeah and the onboard operators there to help with any accessibility needs. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Alder Singh, do you have any questions, sir? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is for Doug or Jonathan. Are there any data history with this vehicle and they, where they're operating currently? Jonathan, would you mind taking that one for us, please? Yeah. Um, so the last I looked, there were, I think, close to a hundred different deployments in the US right now. Um, and a lot of the manufacturers and operators that we work with work internationally. So not only throughout North America, but um, across Europe and the Middle East, Australia and New Zealand. So there is a lot of experience that's been gained over the last 10 years with the, uh, the companies that we're speaking of. And I can point you to several websites, one of which was just launched by the USDOT that documents where current deployments are and some of the speci specifications of those deployments. Um, I'll just throw it out now. If you, if you look for the NHTSA, that's N-H-T-S-A uh, AV test initiative, uh, that should take you to a site um, with a map and you can kind of hover over little pins on a map and you can see who's deploying where and for how long and look up the operator information. But there are other sources as well I can point you to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Alder Smith, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have two questions. Uh, one of my questions 
um, is what's the cost on the infrastructure modification? Um, who's going to pick up that cost? Will the city or will the state or you have some type of vendors? It's a great question. I'll, I'll tee it off and ask Jonathan to fill in some blanks. I think one of the, the major reasons for choosing the corridor is uh, the fiber network in the corridor if needed. But I think also the what really happens in the corridor is where the where the route is picked, the vendor goes ahead of time and maps, digitally maps everything. Um, Jonathan, can you fill in the blanks from there? Yeah, so there are several pieces of digital infrastructure you'd want to consider. Doug mentioned fiber being in the area, which is great. Uh, you need a high speed data connection that's important for the vehicles to communicate with one another, their remote supervisors and infrastructure. Uh, some of the other pieces to consider though is radio communication between a vehicle and a traffic signal, for instance. Um, this doesn't just serve automated vehicles. This currently serves transit and emergency management vehicles in many municipalities. So it kind of depends on the, the local strategy in New Haven. Um, if you looked at it as an effort to not only improve management of your public uh, vehicle fleets, then it could be, it could kind of be positioned as part of that. If you want to just, you know, test some of the communication infrastructure for AVs at first, that's also an option. But the point is the same technology communicates to both types of vehicles and in the future, um, privately owned vehicles as well. There's only a handful of uh, vehicle manufacturers, GM being one of them, that actually has this technology uh, in their commercialized vehicles so far. Um, but it seems like that number will be growing in the future. So um, it might just be an evolution in how the vehicles currently speak to signals also. And I think the, the range, uh, like a signal for one intersection is... Um, a few hundred dollars for the installation and equipment so far. So multiply that by your number of intersections um, is kind of a capital cost estimate. So I just want a little clarification on the modification of the infrastructure. So you're telling me that there's not gonna be any excavation work to happen in the street for this vehicle to maneuver? So, I, I, so we're not committing to any, to paying for any modifications. What John, Jonathan was mentioning was what's called ITS, intelligent transportation systems, things that are affixed to the traffic signal, mast arms and shafts. And so John, I saw Fire, Fire Chief Austin here uh, who was nodding his head when Jonathan mentioned the uh, emergency services personnel. We, we do have eight traffic signals with transit signal priority and about 150 traffic signals with um, emergency management personnel that have the ability to change the, the traffic signal. Um, so the, some of these signals are do have that capability already, but the city is not proposing to add any infrastructure for the pilot. At, you know, but we would have the, 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 the person power capable of installing stuff, as it were, because we do have the, that, that staff on board. And we would want it done to our specification and our staff like to get it right. Um, but at the moment, we're not we're not necessarily anticipating additional uh, infrastructure. We do have the capability, like we're, we're piloting right now with CT Transit on eight, eight traffic signals to install transit signal priority. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so we do that quite, quite frequently in that, in that space. We've had pilots with um, Alphabet Company or uh, you know, the parent to Google, uh, a group called Sidewalk Labs has come in um, to pilot before, but um, but no, we're not we're not contemplating any uh, additional infrastructure at our cost at, at this time. There might be some requests later on, which would have to go through an approval process. But I, I don't anticipate them. Okay, my final question um, is: I noticed that the the size of the bus and that there only seemed to be a one way in for that bus. Am I correct? So what happens in emergency situation? let's say a fire will to erupt, how would you exit those people or where the doors lock, um, being that it's under a system? It's a great question. Jonathan, can you throw the, um, the graphic up that had the 
um, the components of the of the bus. Uh, and I, 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 can you address it? Do all are all shuttles uh, right side boarding, or do, do some have double side boarding, Jonathan? You are muted. Um, so the the shuttles that are these kind of boxy shapes, so the the lower, the easy mod, the local motors. You're right; those do have single doors on one side of the vehicle, but they are all bi-directional. So they could operate in either direction without turning around. Um, the May Mobility and Optimus platforms, these are modified uh, Polaris vehicles, which is a mass produced vehicle. And they have four doors, two on each side. So a more traditional seating configuration. A lot of the vehicles are built with the ability to manually open the door um, in case of some emergency where power is shut down and uh, a few of them have pop-out windows. So there potentially could be multiple exit points. Um, the platform is only 16 feet long, the wheelbase maybe around 14. So there's not a lot of opportunity for uh, additional uh, ingress, egress of the vehicle. The, the door is quite wide and takes up almost the full width in between the wheelbase. So it's it is fairly large for people to get on and off quickly. Um, but I, I, I understand the concern. So we'd want to evaluate which vehicles had window pop outs and report that kind of more specifically to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so it's my turn. Um, at our last meeting on this topic, uh, I believe we had received a letter communication from one of the police commissioners said it was not um, he was not approving he didn't like the idea of this um, since then Doug have you contacted the police department talked to anybody there uh, not not due to that letter um, Jonathan I don't know if you can recall and reca re recast our presentation to the traffic authority I think it was June of 2019 or, or August of 2019 is that right yeah, I believe Craig Lewis provided that presentation. Um, I don't know if he's received a follow up. So, uh, I'm, I'm, so we did we did present to the traffic authority, and concerns were raised. Um, but I, I'm so I'm not. I'm, so there was a member of the authority that sent a letter to the to the committee. Yes, I, I'm not a hundred percent, but I believe it was Commissioner Walker. And what were the concerns raised? I, I could address them now if you would like. Um, I, I don't recall. Mickey, do you have a copy of that? I'm going to try to find it now. Okay. Right. In, in the meantime, while he's trying to find that, I'll bring up my question number two. Uh, who selects the vendor? That's a great question. Uh, Jonathan, would you take that for us, please? I mean, it's, it's essentially the city does through a procurement process. Um, you know, it, it'll depend on whether or or not we have a partner at the table like the Greater New Haven Transit District to try and leverage some FTA funding or the Connecticut Transit to leverage FTA or state funding. Um, but uh, but we are the municipality that's the approved municipality. So it, it's gonna go through our procurement process. Yeah, I'll just add, add a little bit. It would go through your regular procurement process if there was a situation, uh, so recently, for example, uh, Connecticut DOT was awarded $2 million on a project at the CT Fast Track with a company called Robotic Research and New Flyer, a bus provider. So in that instance, they came to the table, applied for funding specifically for a BRT program. Um, and so that partner package received money. And but, BRT is Bus Rapid Transit, which is the Connecticut Fast Track. Um, yeah. So that's that that was a partnership with the uh, with the state of Connecticut, I believe, right, Jonathan? Because it's that there is, right away. That is correct, yeah. So in that instance, they came with the partner package for the funding, but it could also work more traditionally where you go out uh, and bid and have the vendors kind of solicit. So it would just fall under your normal procurement process. So conceivably, we can unite with the other three towns to maybe get a better price. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot can happen. And, you know, I, I'm not sure what their pilots are precisely. Um, but once we're one of the four, we'll be invited to be attending the working groups with the Connecticut DOT and OPM uh, Office of Policy and Management that are um, both uh, like co-hosts of the working group committees. And we'll be able to learn from the other three you know, municipalities uh, and the pilots. I think they're a little further along than we are at the moment, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be to our advantage. Well, the Wingate, is this regarding the same question? Your question regarding? Okay. Um, Mickey, have you found it? You're muted, Mick. All right, we'll let him keep working and we'll go. Does anyone else have a second question? Raise hands, it's easier for me to see. Alder Roth, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two, two more questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, thanks. One, one goes back to what we talked about, I think, at the last hearing about um, just that this is a very busy area, Martin Luther King Boulevard, Junior Boulevard's very quick traffic. There's a lot of ambulances here, obviously, being by the hospital. And I think last time we talked about the concerns of fast traffic coming into contact with a slower moving vehicle and how how that plays out. So I guess a, my question in part, what outreach to sort of neighbors have you done on this? And just have, have there been pilots in other locations that have like a high by hospitals with a lot of ambulances and kind of a road like Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard? So our intent is to perform outreach if and when we're one of the four and we start to see that we'll have a pilot. Um, the amount of outreach, you know, I, I would not want to necessarily uh, perform outreach without knowing if we were actually going to be launching anything on something like this. Um, on, on the second question, I'll ask Jonathan to, ch to, to chime in on what, what other pilots around the world, around the country are being seen right now. And, you know, there's still some route configurations that we would want to make with respect to, you know, MLK has an overly sized shoulder from Dwight West um, that could be restriped potentially with a few extra feet. Uh, again, that would be a, as uh, Alder Smith mentioned, an infrastructure cost that we would ask the project to pick up. Uh, line striping is a simple cost. But, um, you know, there, there were multiple routes with which have varying levels of, uh, of challenges. Um, but, you know, this will be one vehicle every so frequent, you know, every hour, it will be one vehicle uh, every hour. So it'll be the speed of a bicycle going um, in the roadway, which, uh, you know, it will also not be traveling on any one roadway very long, um, the goal of which is to you know keep any issues down to to a minimum. Thank you, and I I know Chief Alston's on the call just maybe to get his view on with with emergency vehicles kind of having if there's any concern on the part of the fire department with the slow moving vehicle kind of right by the hospital. Uh, thank you, Alder. Good evening, all. Um, I'm sort of like a tech kind of, you know, like nerdy kind of person. Um, I've been following these automated vehicles ever since uh, Tesla and Uber started to use them and test them. Um, there were initial concerns with the rollouts because the infrastructure was not able to communicate data fast enough. And so there were issues with some of the vehicles going astray. Um, most of that's been worked out. So there's there's two types of technology that they're using. It's V to V, which is vehicle to vehicle, and then V to X, which is a vehicle to any and everything. And so it uses a, a, a Doug mentioned about the uh, fiber optics, satellite, cellular, and even Wi-Fi. So there are systems of redundancy that are that are built into these. Um, Alder Smith was asking about if there was a fire, if there was something else. Mostly in these vehicles, we've had minor incidents with electrical fires, uh, batteries that have shorted out or um, uh, overheated for whatever reason. We haven't had anything with uh, brakes um, or mechanical um, uh, problems. 
we've had issues, and this is nationwide in any of these systems, where they're recharging them or a maintenance shop where they store the batteries. And there was some type of other incident, like a fire that heated up the batteries and, and caused an issue. Uh, the technology is getting safer and safer and safer. It does communicate on the same system that we use. We use something already in the city of New Haven called the Opticom system. And what the Opticom system does is when we're responding, there is a beacon that sends a signal and it gets the traffic control device, which is the traffic light, to turn green for us. And so what that does is it will allow us, supposedly, the right of way. Now, I've driven all over the world. Connecticut, New Haven, traffic signals are mere suggestions. They <laughs> are not adhered to. Uh, it's amazing to me uh, that the number of people that will just blow a light or even go around me and make a left turn because the light didn't change fast enough. By the way, Water Street and Olive, uh, Doug, you know, let's pick up the pace. But mm -hmm. what I've also seen in terms of the accidents, they're no different than any of the other accidents that we have. Uh, they're no different than the people that are operating around them. They have not been the vehicles that failed to break, uh, exceeded their speed limit, or did not respond to the command. There are systems of redundancy that we were talking about. The vehicle will come to a stop. If it loses a signal, it will, it will come to a stop if there, if there are any other issues. So that's not really my concern. It's everything that operates around the periphery. Uh, in terms of getting people out, if there's an accident, uh, all transportation vehicles have to have a secondary or a tertiary uh, way of exiting the vehicle. Most times it's the train. When you get on the Amtrak, all of those windows open just by pulling that seal apart. And I haven't seen anything different in these vehicles. My questions were going to be, what investment, if we select a vendor, what investment are they going to make in infrastructure, if any? And if we decide not to proceed with this, will that infrastructure remain, uh, obviously, in our care? All right, because if we are moving towards technology, and a lot of these technological developments are looking at targets of 2025 to 2031 in terms of, you know, you hear these, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, commercials about 5G and broader band and faster bandwidth. Uh, is there going to be a benefit to the city of New Haven if we lease these vehicles and all of a sudden we don't have the money to maintain them and we go away, they go away. What investment will the uh, vendor that we, we select give to the city of New Haven? And will that be the, the genesis of us expanding autonomous vehicles or better, at the very least, uh, getting better detection for our uh, for our emergency vehicles in those areas. Uh, well, that was too much. Before we get an answer to that, let me make sure that Alder Roth has her question satisfactorily answered. Hey, no, I very much appreciate that answer. I had my one other question, but should I I can defer to this being answered and then ask my second question. No, ask, whatever. ask your second question first, and we'll move on. Okay, great. Um, and I guess it gets to the point, I appreciate it, what Doug was saying about sort of the goal of this to be to ultimately reduce traffic and single vehicles going on the street. Um, I, I'm not clear where the drop off points are like if because right now you also said it mirrors routes of the Yale New Haven Hospital shuttle. And so if it mirrors routes and the start and stop point are basically hospital points, like would other people actually get on? Would it actually reduce trips or is it just sort of being a substitute for what we already have as the shuttle? If that makes sense. Jonathan, do you have uh, a, a proposed route? Yeah, uh, so here is an overview of the deployment area. And you're right, so far we've outlined shuttle stops at each of the hospital locations. Um, this is primarily because uh, a safety assessment has not been completed. That would be completed with the vendor. Um, and so once that were done, we could, uh, through a public engagement process as well, get input on various points of interest and preferred stop locations that were also safe. Um, so that's something we would definitely need input on at a later stage. And the other the other question is, is it not overlaying service? So the it'll be good to be able to test one service against another um, with the idea being that 
this one is free and available to the public. So it's not just um, not just Young Haven Health Hospital employees that'll be getting on. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I guess I'm wondering though, if de facto, like in reality, that's basically who will be getting on because of the current locations, but um, perhaps there'll be the ability, there would be the ability to create additional stops um, that others would be more likely to be at. Thank you. Okay, uh, just for you, Mickey, should be an email from June 16th, if you can search back that far. All right, Doug, you had an answer for the chief? Oh, uh, so chief's question was about infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of times that people have pilots that um, you bring infrastructure to the table and then you walk away and everybody keeps what they brought and if you will. Um, other other uh, pilots where they leave the infrastructure and anything and all the intellectual property uh, that is that is consumed or um, created can be left with the city. Um, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, one is our pilot with um, uh, sidewalk labs where they tested some camera technology in our city and uh, at, a, at an existing traffic camera. So they were comparing our traffic camera to their traffic camera. Um, they walked away, they gave us some footage and stuff, but they walked away with their hardware. Um, and, the, and the bike share program, it's a little bit different. Um, they've left everything behind, including the bicycles. Um, so that's two different types of pilots, you know, where infrastructure was left behind or taken with. Um, but I think it, it all matters with respect to what we're talking about. Like they're not going to take their line striping with them. Uh, so the line striping would probably remain. And then um, hopefully any improvement to the traffic signals that was a benefit to public safety, we would uh, work on keeping. And, and to Chief's point, uh, the Opticom system is plentiful, but that could be expanded even further. All set, Chief? Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other alders with second question or third question? Alder Smith. Uh, this question is for, thank you, um, Sir Chair. Sorry. This question is for Mr. Jonathan Garrett. You stated that you were from Phoenix, Arizona. Is there any pilot program or program that you have with these vehicles there? Uh, we have pilot programs in Phoenix currently. Um, I'm not operating. I'm not a part of any of their operations. I think most significantly is uh, Waymo, uh, the Google subsidiary or the Alphabet subsidiary uh, operating in parts of the valley here in Phoenix. Um, most recently, a low-speed automated shuttle like the ones we're discussing today was operating in the city of Peoria. They ran a four-month pilot in their entertainment district on public roads. Um, so that's a pretty similar example to what we're discussing today. Um, there's been several others. Uh, Uber, Intel, and GM's crews have all operated in Phoenix over the last several years. Thank you. Um, I asked that because I will be traveling there in the next six days. So I will definitely make sure I try that uh, vehicle in Peoria where I'm going to be staying at. I'll have to let you know if it's still operating. I believe the four month pilot has finished actually. And I don't know if they've started a phase two yet. So. Jonathan, I will give you Alder Smith's email contact so that you can okay. follow up with her for some recommendations on where to check out. And if, you, if you know of any um, companies that are in the area, I'm sure she would be interested in knocking on their door and saying hello. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Sir Chair. You're welcome. Um, I have found the email from Commissioner Walker, and he had his, he had four concerns. One was uh, inadequate speed. I think we've talked about that and covered that already. Um, oh, you got it there, Mick. Good. Illegal legal liability questions. We've at addressed that already. Mechanical or technical malfunctions. I think we've gone over that. We could touch more on that if you if you wish, Mr. Chair. Okay, if you have more, go ahead. Well, uh, just that there will be a, a, an operator on the on the vehicle and Jonathan, you know, fill in any of the blanks that you wish. But the, um, I don't, do you have a vehicle miles traveled statistic, Jonathan, on, on breakdowns and or crashes for how many vehicle miles traveled? 
Uh, not off the top of my head, no. I would have to. So vehicle miles traveled for a, a deployment. Um, I think you could safely say a few thousand over three to four months. Uh, it really depends on the deployment environment. I can get you uh, probably Las Vegas's well, I was statistics thinking more, pretty easily. I think the last time you testified to the safety, sort of the of how frequently these break down or are, are, are partaking crashes, is that right? Oh, as far as, yeah, breakdowns over VMT period. That's yeah, we, we haven't seen any um, like significant offline disruptions. Uh, everything has been taken offline because of um, kind of a required maintenance period. Um, I, I, the only incident I can refer to was uh, in Las Vegas a few years ago on the first day of operation for a Navia vehicle by First Transit, the operator, a, uh, a semi truck backed into, as the cab was turning, it articulated and the cab hit at about two miles per hour, the front end of the vehicle as it was uh, stopped. And so it wasn't a, a moving incident, fortunately, and no one was injured, but that's the only example I can give of a low speed automated vehicle in any time of, in any type of crash. Uh, and, incident. To the, and to the point of loss of communication, there will be a driver operator who can take over the operations of the vehicle and pull it over to the side. That's one of the required redundancies, yep. And then, Mr. Chair, if you wanted to do the, the final point. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, unintended, yeah, unintended consequences, yeah. which always arise when there are major changes in any process or system. And I think the the only answer we would have to this is um, start small. And, and the, the, new, the, the, na the nature of the pilot is to start small. Um, you know, we're not replacing bus lines. We're not, we're not relying on the shuttle, you know, driverless shuttle to get you know, take a CT transit route and, and really harm or, or disrupt the system. It's an additive system, one that if we, if, if it goes down for the day or what have you, um, as a, as a net, as a net to the entire transit system, we didn't necessarily lose anything uh, that we promised, if you will. Jonathan, you have any more thoughts on that? No. Okay. Nothing that. Okay. Thank you for addressing those. Uh, now I get to my other two questions. Uh, well, I have a concern, a safety concern on mine too, is uh, looking at the route. And I think uh, Alder Roth talked about it briefly as well, is uh, the, the route is really not conducive to safety. I don't think it's, even with the low speed, I mean, we have people on bicycles getting hit by cars and trucks in that general area. So uh, I'm really kind of concerned with that. If we if we were to say yes, and this goes forward, does the route that we have already designated, is that written in stone or can it still be changed if we're approved? Uh, can you take that as well as um, discuss the next safety, uh, as you mentioned, the safety study? Yeah. Um, so from, from how, from our conversations with CT, DOT, um, the, the route is allowed to be, um, I guess, updated as necessary. So we go in with an application of our preferred routes and the, and the diversionary routes. Um, but through a procurement process and a safety assessment, uh, if those are not found to be suitable and the risks cannot be mitigated to a satisfactory level, uh, it's something that we could adjust. Um, and as the deployment and, and as a potential pilot deployment um, kind of flourishes, you're, you're also allowed to um, adjust your routes and kind of concept of operations at that time too. Um, so I think that it's a, also a discussion that we could answer better during a safety um, assessment process. Um, but just knowing going into this, we're not locked into these routes is I think the takeaway. Okay. All right. Thank you. And my other question is uh, probably mainly for Doug. The areas that this route go through, I think covers probably about four different wards. Have you had any discussion with the alders in those wards? Not 
nearly enough conversations, but again, we, we're, we're, we're here before you tonight to get the city's permission to take the next step before diving deep into the engagement and outreach. I, I um, also wanna recognize that the president's ward is one of the wards and, um, okay. and I will be in need of a lot more outreach and engagement before a pilot would ever hit, hit the streets of New Haven. I, I, I can assure you of that. All right, it, it just would be helpful if you have already had some in-depth conversation with them before this point, you know, because uh, yeah, they're, they're a critical part of what we do as well, because this is a 30 person team and we try to all work together um, as reasonably as possible. I appreciate that. And, you know, we, we had worked through from something like 25 in a brainstorm, we had something like 25 original con concepts of routing um, and uh, still in the end may not be in this exact route after doing the safety analysis and finding others. You know, we would be more than happy to come back in an advisory to report uh, before any pilot to this committee or to the board and report what the final route would be. And any other alders? Because I would like to get the public input. This is a public hearing and I'd like to get the public have a chance. It's already been an hour and a half. Any other from my colleagues who haven't presented any? All right, then we'll be looking at going to the public. Mickey, how many we have from the public? I'll make the announcement. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment on this item? You can raise your hand or speak up so we can hear you. Anyone from the public wish to testify on this item? For a third time, anyone from the public wish to testify on this item? Seeing none. Make a motion to close the public portion. Second. Moved and second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of closing the public portion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? So carried. The public portion is closed. Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, sir. <laughs> so happy to see that uh, you're well lit up today. I can see you. <laughs> you always have that light on behind you. That's right. That's right. I, you know, it's Thank Tuesday you. night. I've been on Zoom pretty, pretty much all day. That's why I ask my questions <laughs> the way I ask them. <laughs> Let's get to the biscuit, man. Let's stop playing. <laughs> all right. The chair will entertain a motion. But we have to have a motion to discuss anyway. So, someone? Well, I make a motion that we discuss the item that's before us. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Discussion? A little backwards, but it's okay. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Paula Wingate, you had the floor. That wasn't my bell. That's but that's my but that's my bell. Give me uh, 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 all the all the Roth had a question or a comment, so I'm gonna let her go and then I come back. Okay, all the Roth. No, I I had had a question, but I we might be too late. I was just interested in the safety assessment, kind of who does it and what the standards are, but. Yeah, that's kind of we're beyond it a little bit now. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Doug will be able to provide that to you at a later point. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Come in. Oh, the Haywood. I yes. I was just curious about the the. I know we're trying to be. Was it number one of the one of the four? And so I'm curious as to the vendor that comes along. If they don't come along, 
are we liable for more money? How much money are we liable for? Um, do we have to come up with money before the pilot starts? Are we going to say yes now? And then when they come back next week, we need to be able to come up with some financial initiative going forward. I was just a little curious about uh, the finances and going forward. Well, I think Doug touched on that earlier, and it wouldn't normally be appropriate, but I'm going to allow our Director of Transportation to uh, re-address that, if you'd like. Thank you, Madam, Mr. Chair, and I'll, I'll be very brief, which is just that um, there's no commitment of any funds being expended on the city's behalf. Nothing's come before you for that no. request, and um, we would... You know, the, the yes. idea is to find partners that have money and or apply for federal or state grants uh, to find those dollars. Um, but, uh, the, the pilot being a short duration, uh, the maximum exposure would not be more than any grant money we would be able to find and bring in. So I think the risk is low because of just how small the pilot concept is. Um, but at the same time, important to put on the record, no, you know, no, no city funds are expected at this point. You know, would and Yale, if they were, they would come back through through the board. Would Yale have to uh, put in on this uh, pilot plan? Would Yale be, um, am I saying this right? Would Yale have to invest in the pilot plan or just them admitting that they want to be a part of the pilot plan as well enough as we go forward? Well, if, if they chose to be a part of it, they would they would be asked to participate. My my my, uh, as Ger Jonathan mentioned briefly, um, the their transit operator, First Transit, is a uh, is doing pilots in in the country right now on this on this topic. And so, um, but but nobody has committed to anything. And um, since we're not part of the four yet, we don't yet know the appetite of the private sector to kind of take it up. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right. I don't want to get back into another discussion because we've already ended the testimony. Uh, did you have another comment, Alder Wingate? Yes, sir. Thank you. My apologies about that. But when you zoom in from home, things happen. So um, just a couple of comments, right? In, in reference to the pilot program, I think that, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. It's, it's, it's it's a lot of lot of unknown questions for me. Yes. Um, and then I wish our illustrious, you know, director of traffic and parking would have reached out to the alders that is going to connect to the awards about this particular program. Because, you know, me knowing pilots, pilots come reality. Yeah. I've been doing pilots for years. And they do come reality, right? And, you know, there's a lot of safety measures that we have to understand about. Um, and when you talk about this technology, this technology really can't go everywhere because it's not for everywhere in the city because the only technologies around that is Yale, is the hospital, is around those particular general areas. So, you know, this technology has to be condensed around that particular area. So you, you saying that it could be for any and everybody, but that's that's not the way it's to play out. I don't believe. Um, but it's just a lot of it's it's, it's I, I almost think that we should get more information from the, the, the ones who's doing the pilot in Stanford or if they're doing it in Stanford. If we, you know, because it's it's a lot of unknowns right now um, in reference to this. And I, I know that's what pilots are for, but it's just, it's, 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 it's real early for me. I, I just wish we had more, I don't know if we have more time um, before they make a decision on the four that they're going to select and what cities they're going to move to, to give Doug some time to talk to the neighboring orders that it's really going to affect. Um, um, that's, that's why, I, that's why I said at it, you know, I, you know, you know, we had general counsel tell us about what's legal, what's not legal. 
Um, the, the bus got to have somebody on it. We understand the nuances of the batteries and the Teslas and stuff. I just think it's, I, I don't have enough for me personally. All right. All right. I'm going to put it at this point. The floor will be open for a motion to either vote yay, vote nay, or vote to table this item for a future date. Paula Wingate. Um, can you can have chair. another motion if you like. No, no, no. Through the chair, could I? Could I ask Doug Housing Lady? Is there a time in reference to this? And um, you know, if if he could respond. All right. Point for clarification for. Director of Transportation, Traffic, and Parking. I believe we are, uh, Jonathan. Do you remember any of the dates in the in the application from from OPM? Applications are accepted on a rolling basis. Yeah. So, and they started, I think, in what June of last year, or even earlier. So, uh, a little over a year ago, maybe almost two years ago. Yeah. Um, so it. it you know, we're the last city, we're the last, you know, the, the legislation was sort of uh, written with, with the eyes on New Haven. I think it's specifically was hopeful of us, um, that being said, um, you know, so I, there's not a deadline. However, the faster we can get out there and find out from the private sector what sort of markets there for funding, the, the, the faster we would be able to get to work. that answer your question, sir? Thank you. Um, Chair, um, my apologies. What was the two options again? We could either vote yes to go forward, no to not go forward, or if you want to table it to a future date, do we need another public hearing on it? Perhaps we don't need another hearing on it a public hearing on it. Maybe we need another workshop on it. We could do that. I mean, I, I, I think some more work need to be done around it. Well, you have the floor, so. I make a motion that we um, table it to a workshop. I second. Motion has been made to table this to a future date for a workshop and seconded. Any further discussion on that motion? Alder Roth. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the motion. I think, you know, it's a complicated issue. I've heard from, this does touch my ward, um, and I've heard from some people who are eager saying this is an important thing for New Haven to have a voice in. Um, and people who also talk about, they think automated cars may be better than cars with drivers who are, who are not, as the chief said, go through red lights in New Haven. At the same time, I do have, I, I share the concerns of my colleagues, um, that this is a very kind of congested area. Not that I, I'm worried about the traffic around around this vehicle. I'm worried, as I think um, the vice chair said, or not worried, but in reality, will it be used by people other than just being a replacement for the hospital shuttle? Um, okay, and, we're, not, we're not testifying again. Make your oh, point. I thought we were talking about why it's good to have a workshop. So no, I wanted to say, I think just, hearing just, from just, the just. other alders and having them reach out about these questions to their constituents and you know, we didn't have any public testimony. I think this is something that impacts the public a lot. It will, um, and maybe we need to help, you know, people do a better job, all of us um, spreading the word about the the conversation to get more input from the public in a workshop as to their views on it. That's, yes, that's the concept. Thank you, Alder Roth. Any other discussion on this motion? I think some hands I can't see. So we'll, what I'll do is go around the table to make sure I get everybody for the vote. The vote 
is for the motion, which is to table this to a future date for a workshop. All the Wingate. Yes. Uh, Alder Crespo. Did he leave? Alder Roth. Yes. Alder Haywood. Yeah. Alder Singh. You're muted. Yes or no? I I was raising my hand, but we went into the vote and before that, so I guess I cannot say anything to that point. No, we're into, we're into the vote now. Okay. Yes. Alder Smith. Uh, didn't cut you were still muted, Alder Smith. Sorry, my answer was yes. Yes, and it's a yes for me, so it's unanimous vote. This will be tabled and we'll establish a workshop date sometime in the near future so that we don't get left out. The floor is open for a motion to adjourn. I guess there's no other things on the agenda. I make a motion we adjourn. I second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. There's no discussion on a motion to adjourn. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. Have a Thank good you, night. everyone. Thank Doug, you. Good Richard, night. Jonathan, thank you. thank you. Good night, all. Thank you. Bye. Good night, Mick. Thank you. <laughs> You're still muted. <laughs> uh, we still have a couple people in the waiting room. Let's stay on for a minute and see if there's. Uh, I don't see anybody. Okay, so I'm slightly confused as if, like we're if we're adjourning this to a workshop later, but we want to take public testimony, like Alder Roth mentioned that she wants to have members of the public testify about how important it is. Well, that's a public hearing, not a workshop. Right. So uh, the way I understand it is that the chair can take public testimony in a workshop or elect not to. Yes. So, so she can have her people come and we decided whether we want to take testimony. And it may depend on how many people. You know what? I, I don't think it's as critical for that public as I think it is for other alders that should have been here. Okay. At least so the, uh, the four whose wards it touches, other than Brian, I mean. So what I should follow up with Doug and say that... Um, let us know when you have have have, have uh, interacted with the ward alders, and once you've done re outreach to them, then we can schedule the workshop. And was it something else we wanted to get in addition to the outreach? Oh, oh, results of other pilots like Stanford. We can they can get that too. Like, well, was that for us, or was that just something that Abby wanted? Uh, who said that? Um, uh, that was that? Wingate suggested that. He suggested oh. getting info on other pilots and talk to neighboring alders. He's those two things sorted together. All right. Well, we'll probably it's look at December then. For it. We'll probably look at December. I, I hate dragging it on because, I mean, to me, there's just so many unanswered questions. And when you come to a meeting twice with that many unanswered questions, to me, it's a no vote. You didn't do your homework. Why should it be more work for somebody else? That's just me. Okay. Uh, lights are off.
Gee, it didn't even look I turned off the lights. I turned off three lights. It does look just like you're in chamber. I would think you were in the chamber. <laughs> Let's see, get myself smaller so I can fit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went down there a long time ago. And I took that picture and I took one of me uh, or one of uh, the our chairs. Um, let's see where I put that one. Well, that was all conducted meeting, and I think you honed in on, um, you know, what the uh, main questions are. Um, so. Yeah, it was a little bit tough because there's so much, and we we're going back over stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's in the future, they can't answer everything because it's a pilot. You know, first you got to get into the state program. Then once you're in the state program, you go to vendors and then yeah, find out what they're willing to do and what they're willing to pay for. So that's why I think that one of the keys to this is establishing some kind of amendment or some kind of mechanism to bring it back to the Board of Alders at a later date once they have more of those details like who is the vendor what are the routes well you know what how about if we develop develop that that scenario and have it ready to present at the workshop that you know at the workshop 